tonight contradicting explanations for why ride share prices surged this past weekend. This was a demonstration of why Mayor Chow's arbitrary cap on ride share doesn't work. Uber says it's because of a new temporary cap on rideshare licenses, but the city says fewer drivers is a worker retention problem with Uber. The minute you consider any alternative, you realize how little sense the mega spa makes in Ontario Place. And mega opposition to a mega spa will show you the latest push to redraw the plans at Ontario Place. Why organizers think this attempt to tank the spa will be different. There's no real incentive for paramedics to come here because Toronto obviously has the highest workload in the province. And how Toronto's cost of living problem is creating a medical problem. Yesterday evening, Toronto ran out of available ambulances for the second time this month. We're looking into what solutions could help. Hey, good evening. I'm Chris Glover. Thanks for joining us on this Halloween night. Uber says customers got quite a fright this past weekend in Toronto as prices surged and wait times stretched on. The ride-sharing company says it's all because of a new temporary cap on ride-share licenses, but the city is putting the blame back on the company. Adam Khan has our top story tonight. Abdul Rahman has been driving an Uber for the last five years. This past Halloween weekend stands out to him. He says Uber drivers like him couldn't keep up with the rides and customers couldn't keep up with the price hikes. They complaining about the money because the money they before they pay for 30 kilometers like $30. Now they're paying like $100 because of the search price. A couple of weeks ago, city council passed a surprise motion capping rideshare licenses at 52,000 for companies like Uber and Lyft. City staff are now trying to determine the appropriate number of vehicle for higher licenses overall. That's coming in a report expected out next year. In the meantime, the temporary cap is meant to help lower emissions and ease congestion. The councillor who tabled the motion also said fewer rideshare drivers could cut down on competition and boost earnings for those left on the road. But Rahman says forget higher wages, he's losing potential rides. He says he's got fewer customers this weekend because of the higher fares. Uber says it didn't track rides during the pandemic, but the company says this Halloween weekend there was a 31% increase in Uber wait times compared to the same weekend in 2019. And it's blaming the city's policy change for the surge. And this was a demonstration of why Mayor Chow's arbitrary cap on rideshare doesn't work for a dynamic marketplace. But the city says new drivers are able to get licenses. And if there were fewer Uber drivers this weekend, the city says it's a driver retention question for Uber. In a statement, the city writes, there could be any number of reasons why fewer drivers decided to drive for Uber this weekend, including wages, working conditions, or something else. Uber has not demonstrated the connection between the policy change made at council and their drivers deciding against driving for them. Still, drivers like Rahman say regardless of why it happened, the surge prices really impacted his bottom line this weekend. Adam Khan, CBC News, Toronto. Some spooky scenes on full display in Toronto tonight in the city's Forest Hill neighborhood. One house went all out. Our decorations are the best kind in the whole neighborhood. We were like, man, you know, we really want to do something special on Halloween. This year is busy. This is probably one of the busier ones. Oh, yeah, you did something special, all right. The homeowner is going with a prison theme this year, and they say they decorate big each year but always change up the concept, and it keeps kids coming back year after year. I love some chips. Bag of chocolate. <laughs> we got really big chocolate bars and yeah. lollipops yeah. and gummies. It's almost full. Hey, so the treat's not too bad either, and the homeowners say they don't keep track of how many kids show up, but it's usually into the hundreds. And a chilly one out there for trick-or-treaters. Two degrees and a chance of showers as we look live at the city. Maybe even a few flurries expected tonight after midnight. Colette Kennedy is here with the first check on the forecast, and call it flurries on Halloween night. I hope people are home and cozy now, maybe curled up with a drink or something. Yeah, I'm thinking what you're thinking, Chris. The 
It should be tucked into bed by now, but with all the excitement, plus maybe sugar, chocolate high, uh, might be a little hard to sleep. Or are they still, you know, um, trying to figure out and sort the candy? Anyway, time for bed. Night, night. <laughs> Let's show you what happened today with those temperatures. Early, early morning hours. These were what the lows were looking like. That was 2 a.m. And then by 1 o'clock, Toronto was at the high of 6, but Oshawa still hadn't reached it. We claimed another degree or two all the way towards uh, the nation's capital. So in some cases, it did warm up a little more from there. And then we're also dealing with some cases lake effect. It's going to be a little stubborn, too, this band here near Goderich in London. Elsewhere, we just have a chance for some isolated flurries into the GTA and Windsor area from earlier this evening of those sprinkles or a little bit of a wet flurry uh, and then everything kind of improves as we go through the day tomorrow and we get some sunshine coming back so minus two tonight feels like minus six tomorrow it's six for the high still that breeze out of the northwest we will get those temperatures climbing a bit Chris and I'll tell you when that's going to be happening all right call it we'll talk to you again in just a few minutes for the long-range forecast taking you now to Queen's Park, where the Premier was back on the hot seat today. It has been almost six weeks since Doug Ford took questions from reporters and recent developments with the government's controversial Greenbelt land swap. Well, it dominated that news conference. Queen's Park reporter Lorenda Redekop has all the details. Premier Doug Ford faced reporters for the first time since the RCMP announced it's investigating his government's Greenbelt land swap. Have they reached out to you uh, personally for an interview, sir? No, they haven't uh, reached out to me. The newly released documents don't only deal with the Greenbelt, but also other development plans. Emails between government staff ask about developing two pieces of land, partly owned by Flato Developments. Its president, Shakir Ramatula, calls himself a friend of the Premier. In one email, the then Housing Minister's Chief of Staff, Ryan Amato, asks for a map, saying the PO, or Premier's office, wants a picture. Did you instruct your staff to ensure that those lands in Nobleton owned by Shakira Matula no. or any other lands? No, I don't. I don't honestly, out? I don't even know which lands you're talking about. But in saying that, there, no, I didn't, to be very clear. The lands were part of changes to allow urban sprawl, recently scrapped by the housing minister. I said, just pull all of them. I've directed Minister Clandra to pull all of them like I did the green belt. Ford was also asked about his government fast-tracking developments. 18 of those approvals, called Minister's Zoning Orders, or MZOs, went to guests at his daughter's wedding. He dodged the question on how that happened. MZOs is a great tool that uh, have created, folks. It's a, it's a tool that the, the province has been using for, for decades. The opposition parties believe Ford must have been in the loop on zoning changes. I've worked in the Premier's office. I know how government works. It's clear that he knew something. No one, no one believes it when the Premier says, I didn't know anything. There's a straight line back to the Premier's office. Uh, I don't think anyone believes that uh, his staff were acting independently and that he had no knowledge uh, of anything that was happening. Opposition parties hope the RCMP will expand its investigation beyond just the Greenbelt changes. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, now down to Ontario Place and some new momentum in the ongoing pushback against the redevelopment plans that include a large spa. Ali Chiasson explains why this time critics think their arguments might stick. Hey, hey, ho, ho, Thermy Spa has got to go. Hey, what Ontario Place for All is actually saying today is they would like to see the Thermo Spa go elsewhere. And the city councillor leading that charge at City Hall today is Fedina Fort York councillor Osma Malik. The size, the scale and the use that has been proposed for the water spa and park is that it is not appropriate for our waterfront, but it can be appropriate in other places. And this is a very reasonable alternative for us to be able to explore as the city of Toronto and to be able to bring that to, to the province and to say, let's look at something else. That something else is the exhibition grounds where the Better Living Centre stands. It's a massive venue that's said to be underused, already connected to transit. Please, yes, make a spot now. This is a no-brainer. Ontario Place for All and its supporters take issue with the Ford government privatizing so much of the waterfront and its impact on the environment, so they welcome the idea. 
The moment you move it to a place like the X, you're saving half a billion dollars of taxpayer money because you don't need to build a giant underground parking lot, 6,000 parking spots already there. No need for site servicing, which is costing like another $200 million of our money. So the minute you consider any alternative, you realize how little sense the mega spa makes in Ontario Place. The Ford government doesn't seem even close to entertaining it, though. A statement from Infrastructure Minister Kinga Surma's office reads, the vision to rebuild Ontario Place is well underway, with shovels in the ground to repair and replace the underground critical infrastructure. I mean, they seem pretty far along and pretty steadfast in them. We have seen in the last short while uh, the province uh, uh, reverse course and reconsider a number of their uh, proposals and their plans. That echoes what a lot of the critics say. The Ford government did a 180 on the Greenbelt land swap. So why not here? We're amping up that public pressure to make sure that they reverse course on this as well. It took more than public pressure to reverse the Greenbelt land swap. It took an Auditor General report and an Ethics Commissioner report. Contrasting that, at Executive Committee today, there's still hope for compromise. We want to be able to work together for the best outcome for our waterfront. And my request today is to continue that effort and to look at Exhibition Place as an alternative site. The city's executive committee voted unanimously in favor of directing city staff to look at the feasibility of moving the Ontario Place spa plan across the street to the X instead. That report is due back at uh, executive council on December 5th before eventually going to city council to be voted on before eventually going to the province. So needless to say, still a lot more to come on this issue. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Now to a startling piece of information coming from Toronto's paramedics union. For the second time this month, it's issued a code red, and that means no ambulances were available in the city. Union officials have been sounding the alarm for months, claiming they are understaffed. Dale Manukduk has that story. Yesterday at around 5 p.m., Toronto ran out of available ambulances. The union posting on social media that Peel Paramedic Services had to be brought in to help. We had a 92-year-old female uh, unconscious, which is a high acuity call for us. That's what we class as a delta level call, which is a life-threatening call. Um, I should point out, we did have a unit to send, but it was a single medic in an SUV. Response times are getting longer year after year. The union says it speaks to a larger issue. Earlier this month, they flagged another code red. In that post, the union references other GTA paramedic services being more prepared and more staffed. Durham region pays its paramedics more. There's no real incentive for paramedics to come here because Toronto obviously has the highest workload in the province. And, uh, you know, the wages are about the same. Cost of living is expensive in Toronto. Like a lot of our paramedics, that we're averaging a resignation of one a week, which was unheard of. Toronto paramedic contracts are due at the end of next year. The city's paramedic services operating budget for 2023 is just over $315 million, and the mayor highlighted offloading patients at hospitals as the major issue. It is not something that a city of Toronto can do alone. We do not have any control over a hospital, how quickly they could, uh, the emergency ward can offload patients, uh, that can accept a patient. And, and it is so frustrating to watch the ambulance folks that are just sitting there waiting. The province says it's doing its part to support the city. In a statement to CBC Toronto, Ministry of Health spokesperson Hannah Jensen says, through this year's budget, our government has invested an additional $51 million over three years in the dedicated offload nursing program. To get paramedics back into communities faster, this includes nearly $9 million to Toronto Paramedic Services this year. The union says offloading isn't the problem. The only answer is you have to have more ambulances out there to, to, you know, to meet the demand. Dale Manukduk, C Hi, welcome back. We have an update to a story we brought you first last month. Concerns over how Peel District School Board was removing some books from library shelves. It was supposed to improve diversity, but actually led to books being tossed based solely on the date they were published. After our reporting, the province told the board to end the practice, and now some librarians are speaking out about how the process affected their schools. Angelina King has that update. I feel like the training was enough for something as big as this. This teacher librarian says they weeded more than half of the books from their school's library. It's hard to see these books that you love be thrown away. 
CBC Toronto isn't revealing their identity or this teacher librarians because they both feel reprisal for speaking out. The hardest part was some of the nonfiction books, like some of the animal books. I didn't quite understand why I had to get rid of those. The Peel District School Board rolled out the new book weeding process last spring. The goal? Ensure libraries are inclusive. It was put in place in response to the province mandating the board undergo a diversity audit. But last month, the education minister told the board to stop the process after a CBC Toronto investigation found it seemingly led to miscommunication and some schools removing thousands of books solely because they were published before 2008 instead of targeting books that were damaged, outdated or rarely used. We spoke with a handful of teacher librarians. They all support the board's idea, but their thoughts on how it was implemented is a different story. Some say they thought the process was straightforward and fair, but others say they felt it was rushed, unclear, and that it pressured them to unnecessarily toss a large number of books. So was it your understanding that you were to weed all books published in 2008 and prior? Yeah, that was that was pretty much the understanding that we went away with, um, although that was cl cleared up um, over some time because we were told that we could justify certain books. Teacher librarians say that justification was how often the book was borrowed, but no parameters were set. I think in the back of our minds we were thinking, if we don't make a case for this and they catch it on our shelves, are we going to get in trouble? But not all librarians say that was their experience. I've been hearing about this, if it's before 2008, throw it away. That is certainly not what we were told. I never felt like I would get in trouble for that or that there was going to be, you know, some sort of consequence for keeping an older book. Evelyn Ree Ford weeded about a third of the books in her school's library. They're only being taken from libraries because they're not serving our population anymore. The board says it's learned a lot through the process. As with any implementation process, there's going to be some miscommunication and some trepidation. Following the minister's direction, the board says it's cancelled the process, but will continue to review what's on library shelves through an equity lens. We want to ensure that when a student picks up a book, that it's not causing harm. Now the board says it's focusing on adding books. We want to reassure to the, our teacher librarians, the professionals who are, you know, in hand-to-hand uh, -hand with students and staff, uh, that their libraries will be fulsome at, at the end of this process. But some librarians say they received just a fraction of the money needed to do that. You can't cheap out on this. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. All right, call it back to you. And I can't tell if it's actually cold today or if it just feels cold after how warm it was last week. Yeah, our temperatures, it's about four or five degrees below normal in terms of uh, where they've been running. Not great for our trick-or-treaters, but, you know, we all got through it, right? And today's high just six. This is from this morning, that low minus 1.4, but we're actually going to see that temperature uh, dipping down as we continue through these overnight hours. And it's not just the cool air in place, it's those winds. So that cooler air over the relatively warmer waters of the lake sets up the lake effect, and uh, it's this area here where we're going to see one of those a pattern where it's a little more stubborn it kind of hangs in there so uh, you got to be careful when you're driving of course sunny skies and then all of a sudden uh, you can get into some whiteout conditions so yep lake effect we have to start thinking about that again and in terms of our sky conditions otherwise with the wet flurries tonight, possible a few areas like the GTA, um, really mostly it's going to be dry and we start off with sunshine tomorrow and then we'll see some cloud building in into the afternoon, uh, especially through southwestern Ontario. And then Thursday, we'll kind of reverse things. We'll start with sun and the GTA uh, back closer towards London, Windsor. You'll be looking at cloud and then we'll flip that and you'll get more sun in the afternoon. We'll see more clouds uh, coming through the Golden Horseshoe later in the day. few areas just showing you where it's highly localized but where there's more significant uh, snow can actually be piling up and accumulating elsewhere. We're talking about just a trace, all those areas you see in white, which is most cases. Temperatures tonight, keep in mind, factor in that wind chill minus 6 to minus 8, uh, especially uh, breezy through Sarnia, although the temperature a little bit better because of the lake influence there. And for us from St. Catharines at minus 1 to Markham at minus 3, uh, a cool start.
to the day on uh, Wednesday, we'll be experiencing a high of just six, but there it is. I mentioned earlier in the show, we'd start stepping it up a little bit. Uh, eight degrees on Thursday and then Friday, 11, we get back towards double digits. A reminder to this weekend, those clocks fall back Saturday when you go to bed. Oh yeah, good reminder. All right, thank you, Colette. Changing up our show coloring there for orange in honor of Halloween tonight. And thanks so much for joining our program this Halloween. Of course, one of the best nights of the year, no matter how old you are, from the candy to the costumes, there's just so much to love about this holiday. And for the kids at R.H. McGregor Elementary, the fun got started first thing this morning. Check it out. A sewer wrestler. A pirate. Um, I'm a grandma. I'm Satan's daughter. <laughs> Kids are parading, we're showing off our costumes, we have a haunted house, our staff are all decked out in costume, and we have an incredible video arcade that is handmade, hand designed by our students, of course with a very scary theme, and all the kids go through the arcade, so we've got a ton of things going on on this wonderful Halloween day. You've got 200 points, you can have a candy, and if you have 400 points, then you can have a squishmallow. Last year there was an arcade and it kind of had the same idea. So we were thinking, trying to like, recreate that. And that's really it. It's got 200, so you can have a candy. They're applying their knowledge of science, technology, engineering, and math in creating games using recyclable materials. So they bring in things like cardboard, paper, recyclable plastics into the building and they use those materials to create arcade games. Then they invite some of the younger students, so our kindergartens all the way up to grade four get to come and play the games and win some really cool prizes. So some of them are Halloween themed, others are just for fun, but it's a really interesting way for the kids to apply what they're learning at school and to have a little fun with some of their uh, their classmates. So far it's really good. Yeah. I can't wait to go trick or treating. It'll be really nice. Yeah. Happy Halloween indeed. And in all those costumes, I didn't see any broadcasters. What's the deal with that? All right, that's our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you back here tomorrow night at 11. And as we leave, here are some uh, more Halloween trick-or-treating pictures for you. These are coming to us from a fundraising display on Headington Avenue in Midtown, and all the proceeds are going to sick kids. I hope you had a safe and happy Halloween, everyone, and we'll see you back here tomorrow.